morning, everybody. It's dawned on me, so more so this past week than other weeks, that you don't see people smiling anymore because they're all behind masks. So I assume you're all smiling. I assume you're all, ha- assume you're all happy to be here. I'm trying to see it in your eyes. <laughs> Some people can smile with their eyes, you know. I don't think I, I don't do that, but uh, made things easier. Glad you're here. Let's open our service in prayer. Father, I thank you for every person who's here in this room. I thank you, Lord, that um, every Sunday you call us here and you have a purpose and a reason for each one of us being here. And you want to speak to our hearts, speak to our minds. You want to comfort us. You want to encourage us. You want to convict us and challenge us. And I pray, Lord, that whatever whatever our place is this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would meet us where we are and that we would come away from this morning um, somehow closer to you, somehow different than the way we walked in. And so we just uh, welcome you here this morning and ask for your touch upon this service and upon our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. He first loved. Let's read together these words that are on the screen. These are verses that were taken from a letter written by uh, John, and it's one of my favorite books in the Bible. I just, I love the way he just makes everything so clear, and he's so passionate about what he's writing. So uh, let's just read these verses. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God and God remains in him. We love because he first loved us. Those words, God is love, those have got to be like one of the most absolute favorite verses of of people around the world. God is love. They've got to be like the most memorized, the most recognizable, the most recited words. God is love. But if we are created in God's image, and if God is love, what does that mean for us? What does that mean for how we are supposed to live our everyday lives? Does it just mean that we're supposed to receive his love and to say, oh, well, God loves me. No matter what I do, it's okay, because God loves me, and um, he thinks I'm wonderful. Or is there more to it than that? And you know, there's, with the Bible, here's a clue. There's always more to it than you first think. So we're going to spend some time this morning uh, reading through some words, reading through a congregational reading that helps us to walk through what that means. What does it mean to us that God is love and we are created in God's image? We have a new sign language word for this morning, just one word this morning. And that word is first. First is your thumb and a finger. And you go, first, first. So we say, God loves first. And you may remember a while ago, we learned the word for why. Why? If you're asking a question, you ask why. And one of the interesting things about sign language is the word for why is the same as a sign for because. It's the same sign. And the difference is your facial expression, your body expression. Why? Because. So it's the same word, just saying there's a reason, and this is what the reason is. So we are going to be signing why God loves first. Let's speak the words together that will be on the screen. Next screen, please. Perfect. What am I made to do? I am made to love. I am not alone at the center of my universe. I am surrounded by people just like me who call themselves I. Human brothers and sisters created by God and who I am called to love. Why? Because God loves first. Why am I made to love? 
Love has a reason. Love has a meaning. Human beings are not just evolutionary happenstance. Every person is immeasurably precious. Every age, every social status, every race. To show love is to see their worth to God. Why? Because God loves first. How am I made to love? Well, what does God's love look like? Choosing a relationship with every person, seeking us out when we walk away, suffering alongside us, connect, correcting us when we get things wrong, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, grace towards friends, kindness to strangers. Why? Because God loves first. Heavenly Father, this is our prayer this morning, that you would make us a people of love, a people who can be courageous enough to reach out to those we don't understand or know. Make us forgiving enough to receive back those who have hurt us and to begin again. We pray that you would make us strong enough to suffer alongside with those who suffer and make us wise enough to correct each other when we go astray. God, you are our love. You have made us to be like you. You have made us to love, to be your love in the world, to be your voice, your hands, your feet, and your life. God, teach us, shape us, make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I need you, Jesus, to come to my rescue. Where else can I go? Thank you, Lord, that we can come to you like this. We can pour out our heart like this and call out to you for help and call out to you for rescue in our time of need. And Lord, as we look at this idea, as we look at this subject in Scripture, Lord, I pray that you would help us to look at things maybe a little differently than we had before. Help us, Lord, to have that freedom to be able to pour out our hearts to you. Lord, please give me the strength to do this. Take this time into yours, Lord. Do whatever you'd like with it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When Ruth put that title of, of uh, that song on, on her email that she sends me every week, I'm like, I don't think I know that song. But then once we started singing it, I'm like, yeah, I'd, I'd heard that chorus before. And it, it so fits. How, how do it, it was a song that kind of expresses how someone feels in times of suffering, expressing how one feels in times of difficulty, calling out to God. How do you express yourself when things are really bad, when you're in the midst of really difficult situations? How do you give voice to what you're feeling? How do you give voice to what you're experiencing? How do you express yourself to God when you're in the middle of difficult stressful, even traumatic situations. It kind of depends on your upbringing or maybe your church experience. Maybe you brought up in a home where, you know, you, the stiff upper lip is really important. You're just not supposed to express stuff. Or some churches um, just really focus on that the, the Christian is to live the victorious life. And any expression of suffering or pain or difficulty is a sign of weakness or a sign of a lack of faith. Some people get totally lost in their suffering, and it became very dark. Over my years working with young people, I remember a couple of girls in particular would write these poems that were just, I appreciated them because they were this honest expression of their pain, but they were just so dark and they had no hope in at all. And a lot of people connect with that. Um, I was thinking, you know, I was involved with youth long enough that I remember when Avril Lavigne first came out and, and she was being sold as this morose, sullen teenager that just had these very dark songs. And, and today we have Billie Eilish, who's, a lot of her songs are very much the same and are really connecting with a lot of young people because of the, the darkness in the, in the lyrics. Some people will just put their feelings aside because you know what? <laughs> All I gotta focus on is putting one foot in front of the other. So the, even the thought of expressing myself in suffering, um, it's not even on my radar because you know what? I gotta get through today and then I gotta get through tomorrow. And so you just keep plugging away. When I, I presented this at, the, at our university um, group and when the topic was shared with me that this is what I was to speak on, I immediately went back to Camp Livingston, which is a Christian camp in the Eastern townships of Quebec where our church used to go for a lot of our retreats and stuff. And I remember one year, I think it was my last year of university, I was really struggling. The year after I graduated from university was probably the, the worst time in my faith ever. And um, I remember that the Sunday morning came along and I was not in a good frame of mind. And I just, I, I skipped out on the service and I walked into the forest up on the hill as far as I could where no one would hear me. And I screamed and yelled and just vented at God completely not so much ang more angry at myself than at him, but I just needed to get it out. We want to look at a few scriptures, four scriptures, in fact, today that demonstrate a biblical pattern of giving expression to our suffering, to give expression to how we're feeling about difficult times. And I think they strike a balance between the honesty that we need to express the reality of what we're feeling, but also being a, an encouragement to ourselves of, of God's goodness and God's power and how God is trustworthy in the middle of our suffering. So let's take a look at the first one. It's in Luke chapter 22, verses 39 to 44. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, pray that you will not fall into temptation. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. 
So leave that slide up there for now, Nathaniel. Jesus was facing here suffering and anguish that we, we can't even begin to comprehend. I always thought growing up that, you know, the focus of Jesus' prayer in the garden, this was, this was the day, the night before he was going to go to the cross. And he knew what was going to happen, being, being fully God. And I always kind of focused on the physical suffering, you know, the anguish of the cross that he was going to experience and, and all the physical aspects to it. But what he was really feeling the most anguish about was the fact that he knew that in about 12 hours, he was going to become sin for us. Uh, Jesus, who knew no sin, was going to bear on his being, on his, his shoulders, on his personality, uh, the sins of billions of billions of people on this earth who lived before him and have lived after him and who live after us. He, and just the anguish of thinking that that was what he was going to experience brought him into such a place that he was sweating drops of blood. And he expresses to himself, to God, he expresses himself to God the Father in two ways. The first thing he says is, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. In other words, he's saying, Lord, is, is there any other way we can do this? It's okay to come before God in our suffering and say, Lord, is, isn't there some other way? It's always okay to ask God to take away the source of our suffering. It's always okay to ask for a miraculous healing because God still does miracles. It's always okay to pray for a complete change in our situation that's giving us such anguish and suffering. But it's never okay to demand it from God. If Jesus can pray, as he does pray the, sec the second part of his prayer, Lord, if it's your will, then how much more are we called to be able to pray, Lord, according to your will? That's the second part of his prayer in the middle of suffering. Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. There's this complete trust in God the Father that God is all-knowing, that God is all-powerful, that he is good and that he is kind, and that he knows what's best for our good and for his glory. The cry of our heart for difficult things in our life to change always needs to be accompanied by that trust, that knowing that God will do what's best. And even if that trust is small, and even if we need to repeat it over and over and over again until we actually believe it, it still needs to be a part of, of our express, expression in suffering to God. I may have told you this before, but when I was in, my, when I was in Bible college, um, I came down with a, a virus that was followed by lingering symptoms that knocked me out for six months, and I had to miss work, I had to miss a semester of school, and I had to move back to my parents' house and have them look after me. And I remember one night just totally fed up and just thinking, God, what are you doing here? I mean, it was, I, I called it, it was my silent scream prayer because I didn't want to wake up the household. So I was like, God, you know, screaming a whisper. And as I prayed, I began to morph into a different mindset. And I remember, I, I just remember saying this prayer over and over again. God, I trust you. 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 I think I was saying it over and over again to try and convince myself so that I would believe it. And I think by the end of the prayer, some faith had risen inside my heart that it's like, okay, I, I still want this changed, Lord, but, but I trust you. We can follow Jesus' example of expressing himself in suffering by laying our circumstances before God and asking him to change things, giving thanks to him if he does, and trusting him if he doesn't. Okay, the second scripture verse we're going to look at is Psalm 13. We actually did this last week as a Lectio Divina. We, prayed it, we read it and prayed it together. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise for he has been good to me. We'll leave that up there. 
There are a number of psalms that are called psalms of lament, and this is one of them. They are very honest. The psalmist expresses the despair of his condition. They're very honest, very straightforward, and they are an encouragement to, to it's, it is an encouragement to find these expressions in suffering in Scripture, the examples of, of how we as God's children can, can express ourselves even honestly and in a very raw way in suffering. And this, I've, this psalm is just classic. It's, it's short, and it shows the three sections of a psalm of lament, which correspond to the three kind of ways that we journey through in expressing ourselves to God in the middle of difficult times. So the first two verses is the cry of the heart, laying out the situation honestly before God. How long the psalmist feels forgotten. He feels that God's even purposely avoiding him. There's this internal conflict going on. He says his thoughts are just shooting off in all directions. There are these temptations to despair. There's this deep-seated sorrow in his heart and sadness. He, he doesn't feel victory in any way. He feels beaten, and he expresses all that in the first two verses. When these girls I was telling you about who wrote these very dark poems, there was one who was a Christian, and I used to tell her about the Psalms of Lament, and I used to say to her, okay, it's a really good, honest poem, but see if you could find what I called an uptick. Yes, this is honestly how I'm feeling, how I'm feeling, but at the end, can we turn it up towards God a bit? And all of the Psalms of Lament are like that. There's a turning in them. And so the next two verses are the beginning of the turn, beginning to ask God for answers. Please answer me, God. Even in the midst of sorrow and despair, the psalmist knows that it is God who will provide the answers. Even though there's a part of him that still feels like God's forgotten him, there's still a part of him that knows that God hasn't. And God is the one that he needs to turn to for help. There's this beginning of desperation. Lord, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And there's power in a prayer of desperation. Then the last two verses is the end of the uptick. It's, um, it's not a full answer. It's not an answer to his dilemma. But it's a renewed trust in God. As I've been at university over the, this whole semester, we've been looking at the theme of suffering. And I brought a few of these messages here as well. And in some of the reading, I've come across something, a common thread is, th is written through some of these books that I've read. And that is that in response to our suffering, God doesn't always provide answers, but he always provides himself. He doesn't always provide answers. You won't always know why. You won't always know what's going to happen. But he always provides himself to walk with us. And so the psalmist in the last two verses reminds himself, I know God. He can be trusted. Because of his unfailing love, I can trust that he will do what's best for me and for his glory. And in all that I face, I can be sure of the cross, be sure of where my help, where my salvation comes from. He has been good to me, and I can praise him that even in the middle of my circumstances, he has been good in the past. He's blessed me in the past, and he will bless me again in the future. So in this six, these short six verses, we've gone from, how long, O oh Lord, to I trust you. And that's often the journey that God wants to bring us on as we face difficult times. It gives us a picture of how we can express ourselves before God. So first, express your reality honestly. Like in the first two verses, express to God how you feel. It may not be a reflection of the best day. You know how these days, especially in social media, uh, you're, you're always, nobody ever posts a picture of themselves when they, they look horrible, when they haven't shaved for, four, shaved for four days and their hair is a mess, and you always put your best foot forward. We don't have to do that with God. We can express ourselves honestly, even if it's not our best day, and lay ourselves bare before God. And secondly, the middle two verses, ask him for help. Those girls with the depressing poems, they always stopped at step one, express yourself honestly, and that's good. But it just leaves you in that dark place. The next step is the uptick, the turning. Turn to God and ask for help. Always ask for help. It's always okay to ask for help. Continue to lay out your need and the reality of your situation. And then third, begin to see your situation in light of who you know God to be and in light of what he's done for you in the past. Begin the process of 
it's not about denying your reality. It's not about denying the first two verses, denying your suffering. But it's about seeing, God, beginning to see God as some, someone in something bigger than your suffering, someone who loves you with an unfailing love and someone that you can trust in to do what's best as you're going through these rough times. Another psalm of lament we want to look at is Psalm 142. Now this one, the introduction is not on the top, but the introduction is really neat. It says, by David, when he was in a cave, a prayer. So this is not David in a palace, this is David in a cave. And he says, I cry aloud to the Lord. I lift up my voice to the Lord for mercy. I pour out before him my complaint. Before him I tell my trouble. When my spirit grows faint within me, it is you who watch over my way. In the path where I walk, people have hidden a snare for me. Look and see, there is no one at my right hand. No one is concerned for me. I have no refuge. No one cares for my life. I cry to you, Lord. I say, you are my refuge, my portion in the land of the living. Listen to my cry, for I am in desperate need. Rescue me from those who pursue me, for they are too strong for me. Set me free from my prison, that I may praise your name. Then the righteous will gather about me because of your goodness to me. David was in a cave. It is very likely, scholars say, that this, this was written when David was being pursued by King Saul. God had instructed that David be anointed to be the king, but Saul was already the king. And initially, Saul and David got along really well. But as time went on, Saul got very jealous of David. And, and very paranoid about David and, and sought to kill him. So David and his followers had to go and hide out in the desert and ended up in this cave. And in this psalm, we see David laying out his feelings before God and kind of maybe going the opposite way of the other psalm. Take a look. It says, starts out with a prayer to the Lord. I'm crying aloud. He's, he's shouting in the forest. He's calling out for God's mercy. He recognizes that even in the middle of his difficult situations that he's not blameless, that he still needs mercy from the Lord and help. And then he kind of continues going down where he goes, well, here's my complaint. Here's what I want to complain about. Here, here are my troubles. I don't know about you, but uh, nobody really likes a, a chronic complainer. Nobody likes a whiner. No one likes being one of those people. But here David quickly moves into that mode. I got a complaint to make. I got a beef with you. And apparently it, we see God's patient. <laughs> this psalm doesn't stop at verse 2 as if God has struck David dead. He was okay with it. He was patient. Um, God knows we're human. And suffering can make us complainers. And he's okay with that. In verse 3 and 4, we can watch the downward spiral continue. He says, God, when, when I am weak, you are the one who watches over my way. That's good. You protect me and you have your hand guiding my life. You, you care for me as I walk along my way. Good frame of mind. But then the troubles and the suffering crowd in. Because when I walk along the way, my enemies have laid all sorts of traps. People are always trying to trip me up. My way is not secure. There are so many hazards and so many troubles. And as I face these hazards and troubles, there's no one there to help me. No one at my right hand to be my guide, to be my friend. No one's concerned about the troubles I go through. I am on my own out here. In fact, I've got nowhere to hide, no safe place where I can be relieved from, relieved from my suffering. Why? Because no one cares whether I live or die. That's why. See? Downward spiral. The reality of suffering and the impact on our lives is sometimes even when we start off with a really good frame of mind, it doesn't take long for our suffering to erode our confidence and to erode how we see God and we begin to see only our problems instead. But David's thoughts and feelings are here in Scripture to, to, to give voice to how we actually feel sometimes, to give voice to how it can feel so very unfair sometimes, to give voice to those days when we do feel completely alone. But then verse 5 is the pivot where the turn starts, and it's almost like, as I was reading this, I'm like, I could almost picture David taking a deep breath and going, okay, okay. And he starts praying. Not, not a, a formal prayer with kind of highfalutin language, but, but a cry, 
a prayer in the form of the cr cry of the heart that gives voice to his situation and voice to his feelings. And then he reminds himself as, uh, as to who God is by quoting scripture to himself. God is my refuge, my safety, my resource in the middle of suffering. I don't like pat answers. I don't mean for this to sound like a pat answer. But prayer and the scriptures are key, important ingredients in surviving times of suffering and surviving times of despair. Prayers that honestly lay out your complaint and your situation. And scriptures that affirm that you can be honest with God and that and it affirms who he is so that you remind yourself and you don't lose sight of who he is in those difficult times when it is so easy to lose sight of who he is. And then David moves into a prayer in verse 6 and 7. It's a cry in the middle of desperation, a desperate place. It's, not, it's painful, it's not comfortable, but sometimes a place of desperation can often be a good place for the child of God to be. One of my favorite Christian singers as a young adult was Steve Kemp, and he had a song called He's All You Need. And in the liner notes of those things called records, uh, he wrote this quote. He said, uh, you'll never know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you've got. You'll never know Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you've got. Sometimes God has to bring us and allow us to go to that desperate place in order to really show us his faithfulness and his unfailing love. And when everything else is stripped away and you realize that life is getting desperate and you don't know what to, what to do or where to turn, it's then that we can pray that prayer of desperation and allow God not to give us necessarily the answer, but to give us himself. David goes on with the realization that in his own strength, he can't deal with the problems that pursue him. Um, it's an important reality to give voice to and that to turn to God, as we sang before, for rescue, for help. It's the realization that I am powerless as if in a prison, he says. So we turn to God for freedom. We respond in praise. And then he talks about how there's a testimony to others as to God's goodness at work in our lives. Sometimes one of the best ways to share the gospel, one of the best ways to give testimony to others about what God is doing in our lives is for them, to others, to watch how we walk through suffering and watch how God works in our lives in those desperate places. It could be such a testimony to those around us. And it gives meaning, gives meaning to our suffering. So God knows that in times of suffering, even when we try to get it right, we can quickly turn our eyes back to those circumstances and the scripture shows us that we can give a full vent to that, to cry out to the Lord, to give voice to how you're feeling, but also to give voice to the truths that you know about God, to remind yourself that in the middle of that desperation, to let God's spirit and his scriptures, his word, give voice to what God can and will do in your life. I want to look at one more scripture verse, and that's in Romans chapter 8. I think this one's on two slides. So we'll look at the first one, Romans chapter 8. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits with e in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to, to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it. In hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay, and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies, for in this hope we were saved. Next slide. But hope is what is, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. 
And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. This passage is in a whole context of suffering. Paul starts by writing out uh, that our present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that awaits the child of God in eternity. Later in the passage, he talks about all the different things, you know, through, through sword and through wars and through famine, shall anything separate us from the love of God. He's talking about a lot of things that make humans suffer. He talks about how creation groans, awaiting what God will do to ultimately redeem it. And his children inwardly groan, awaiting the full redemption of our bodies and our adoption to sonship. And in the same way, he says, the Spirit groans through us. Sometimes we have no clue. No clue how to give expression to our suffering. The words just won't come. It's hard to explain. We have no idea to explain to someone else or even to ourselves what we're going through or how we're feeling. And we have really no idea what to say to God or even what to ask for help. Sometimes you're so surrounded by troubles, you know you need help, but you don't know what to ask for. You don't know where to start. And when we come to the end of our rope and we don't know how to pray, verse 26 tells us that the Holy Spirit prays through us. The Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. You ever groan? Usually if you're in a, a, a pain that, that's sudden, you know, you stick your hand on a hot stove or, or pick up a hot pot without oven mitts like I did last night, and you, you, it's like you don't groan, you go, ah! You know, it's like, it's like an ow moment. It hits you suddenly, and then it's gone. But chronic pain, that thing that just goes on and on and is always there, the kind of ache that suffering and anxiety and troubles can bring, that's not an ow kind of pain. That's a, uh, that's a groan kind of pain. And the Spirit, the Spirit wants to, to groan through us to intercede through us, to take on our chronic pain and give it expression. And when you come to the end of your rope and you don't know how to give expression to your suffering and pain, the promise is that the Spirit will step in and intercede through you. This could be literal groans, you know, where you just don't know what to pray and you just feel all you can do is just make sounds. And that's the Holy Spirit wants to be able to to pray through to those. I did a paper on this verse in Bible College, and there are a number of scholars who think in the context of Paul's other teachings that this can also include praying in tongues, if that's something you've been gifted with, that when you have no idea how to pray, the Spirit just prays through you, and you just sense this, this release that the Spirit has expressed how you feel. So however this works out in your life, you can know that when you just can't find a way to express yourself in suffering, the Holy Spirit wants to do it for you and give you this freedom, give you this release. And knowing that what you are expressing is in line, the scripture says, in line with the will of God because it's his spirit that's doing the praying. Suffering can bring desperation. Desperation can bring us to the end of our rope. And in that, that place, the scriptures give us the freedom to express ourselves before God. The freedom to ask him to change our circumstances and to relieve our suffering. The freedom to express our feelings of frustration or loneliness or however we're feeling. The freedom to cry out to God, not a nice, polite prayer, but a cry of desperation. The freedom to remind ourselves of who God is and that even in the middle of our tough times, he is good and he can be trusted. The freedom to hold on to and be reminded of the truths of scriptures. In the book of John, one of the Holy Spirit's jobs is to remind us of the things we've been taught before. And that's a precious gift when we're in the middle of difficult times. And the freedom to know that when, that when we come to the end of ourselves, when words just won't come, the Holy Spirit promises to step in and to intercede for us, and to give expression to our suffering. Would you pray with me, please?
with our heads bowed and our eyes closed just so you can focus. I want to give you a chance to express yourself to God within your own heart, within your own mind. Maybe even holding back, thinking, oh, I could never tell God what I'm feeling or what I'm going through. He already knows, but he wants to hear it from us. It does us good to express it. Maybe you're feeling like, you know, well, I, I, it's hard to see good in my situation. It's hard to see where God is. Maybe you just need to take a moment in silence and let the Holy Spirit remind you of how good God is and how good he's been in the past and how he wants to walk with you through what you're going through. Maybe you, you're doing pretty good, but you know some friends who aren't. You just need to pray for them. Take this moment of silence just between you and God. Express how you feel. Express yourself in your suffering and let God respond. He may not give you an answer. He may not answer all your why questions, but he will give you himself. Take this moment to make this message personal in your life. Father, I thank you that in a world that doesn't always feel very safe, that you've given us this safe place to express to you who loves us with an unfailing love, to express to you how we feel and what we're going through. That we can come before you as Jesus did and say, is there any other way? Lord, I pray that you would help us, as Jesus prayed, to be able to say, Lord, I trust you. We'll do things your way, because you know what's best. I pray, Lord, that you would give each of us that freedom to cry out to you from the depths of our hearts when we need to. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would remind us continually that you are walking with us, that you would bring to our mind those scripture verses that we learned long ago that we need to hold on to, that become the anchor, that become the, the one thing that we can hold on to in the storm. And Lord, if, if we're in a place where we haven't learned a lot of your word, a lot of scriptures yet, I pray that you would lead us to those places, lead us to those, those verses, those phrases, those, those words that, that can become anchors in our lives when things are really rough. Thank you, Lord, that we can trust you. Thank you, Lord, that, that by your spirit, you, you, you give expression when we just can't put everything into words. You want to give expression to how we feel and to intercede for us and to pray through us. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to give you the freedom to do that for us. Lord, I thank you for giving us the strength to live with the why questions sometimes hanging out there. Help us, Lord, to be 
satisfied with, with you. I pray, Lord, that you would fill us with more of yourself and your love and your, your peace and your comfort and your strength so that even though the why questions are still there, they don't weigh on us quite so heavy. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you that you walk with us through everything that we go through. And help us, Lord, to, Lord, to always make that uptick, always make that turn towards you, to cry out to you for help. We thank you that you're always there. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just stand with me, please. Scripture tells us that Christ is ever before the throne, interceding for us on our behalf through all of our troubles, through all of our, whatever we need. Know that he stands before the throne of grace and, is, and has you on his mind, whatever you're going through. And he and the Father see what you're going through. They talk about it. And they intercede. And they give you themselves. God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This week, whatever you're going through, may you have an increased sense that even though you may not have all the answers, that God is giving you himself. And he can be trusted. And he is good. And he loves you with a love that will never, ever fail. May God bless you today. If you want to visit and chat a little bit, do it from an appropriate distance. Enjoy the snow outside. Drive safely. <laughs> and uh, see you next week. <laughs>